so today we are going to continue the conversation on uh, creating financial health for ourselves, families, what have you. And we're going to talk about insurance today and um, how insurance can impact your financial health. So Toby with McKnight Insurance is here with us today and he is going to kick this off. So first we talk about insurance as a whole. So when you think about insurance, insurance is there um, in place of crisis. If something goes on, um, something with your house, accident with your car, uh, uh, insurance is there to put you back together, uh, make you whole again. So that's kind of the purpose of insurance. Um, that's the reason we have it. Uh, mortgage companies require it. Anything that you have a loan on, the bank is normally going to require you to have that insurance. Uh, and that's in case something happens to that uh, asset, they're able to get that put back together and the bank is still able to secure that loan. So that's kind of the, the basis for having insurance. Uh, from there, insurance, as we all know, is going up. Um, so it's more overall, we know we have to have it. So we get back to how do we, within our control, how do we help control the cost of insurance? And that's kind of where where I want to talk today in a few different avenues. So um, something that affects all of us is, is car insurance. Um, one of the easiest things you can do with car insurance is raise your deductible. The, the negative to that, if you do have an accident, Whatever you raise that deductible to, you better have that deductible in savings ready to write a check um, to cover the deductible and get the insurance kicked in. So that's a, that's a plus for some and a minus for others, but that's definitely a way that you could initially start saving uh, on car insurance. What, um, what is the average? To, like On average, what are you quoting as a deductible in car insurance? Um, a thousand. I mean, if you want to like a thousand is kind of where a lot of people. I shouldn't say a lot of people start, but if you want to start seeing some savings, mm-hmm. you can kick it up to a thousand. Um, you can go beyond that. Um, people get a little hesitant above that because anything. Again, you better have that in the savings account ready to write a check, and that's not something you're saving up for. That's write me a check. Um, I can add on to that. So I'm not a financial advisor, but we do have that at the branch. And many, many times, whenever people are financial planning, they say, "How do I get out of this hole?" Most people think, "Oh, I got to pay off my uh, high interest debt first. That's not what the wealth advisors say. They say you need to create an emergency fund, rainy day fund, whatever you want to call it. Most people don't know why that would be. Well, that's because to cover those deductibles, because it doesn't matter if you have zero dollars in credit card debt, if you can't cover your deductible during a rainy day, then you're, you're it, that's going to put your entire livelihood at stake that's a good point and how much do they normally what percentage you, so you need to be able to cover all your deductibles so okay. if your if your car deductible is or auto deductible is 750 bucks but your homeowner's insurance deductible is significantly higher mm-hmm. we they need to be able to cover all of it I don't, and, I don't your have health insurance. and your health insurance but and typically that's going to come directly out of your paycheck most cases but uh, sometimes not too mm-hmm. so you just have to keep that in mind yeah uh, so that's a co- uh, one thing you can do in car insurance. The other one is watch your frequency. Um, so a lot of carriers right now are looking toward um, not just the amount of claims that you've had as far as the dollar value, but also frequency plays a part in that. So let's say you've had an accident and accidents are a lot of times out of our control, um, but you have the accident and then maybe you have two windshield claims. Well, now they're looking at it like you've had three activities on that uh, on that policy. That's limiting where you can go in this hard market as far as what carriers we can put you with. So they're not evaluating the type of claim. It's just a claim period. It's just it a claim. Okay. So we're in right now what everybody considers a, a hard market and, and a very hard market. And what that means is carriers are not looking to place a lot of new business. Um, they're kind of limiting on what they're taking. So they're kind of looking for any reason to decline stuff. Um, and that could be, you know, you've got too many activities on that, on your driving history. So that limits us as an independent agent as far as what what carrier we can market you to. 
so watch the claims frequency on that. Um, I would say outside of that, like moving into the, the home insurance, home insurance is, is going up, as everybody knows. Um, again, watch the claims on that. Um, especially carriers are very hesitant of water damage. So any water damage that you can cover, you know, out of pocket is always good to keep that off your claims history. Um, as we all know, insurance steps in, you know, if your air conditioner backs up and we, I mean, I've had that happen years ago where it come through the ceiling, you got to repair all that. Well, within reason, you know, if you can cover that out of pocket, it's going to help you long term. Uh, it may hurt in the short term to write that check, but when you consider that claim sitting there for <laughs> several years down the road, it's going to benefit you just to help you out where you can. How many, how many years <laughs> does the claim stay on your record? It varies from carrier to carrier. It's kind of between three and five, depending how far they go back. And that's that's with FARS as well. So, um, Is there any way to kind of do the math on that when you're doing a claim? Like, hey, if I pay this $2,000 now, my premium is not going to go up. But if I make a claim, my premium is going to go up hundred dollars, you know, so there's like a break you like, okay, but it's yeah. hard to know whether, it's, it's, how much would it go up if I make a claim or not? Yeah, there's not like a like a claims calculator or anything yeah. like that where you can do hypotheticals or anything. So it's just kind of of a educated guess yeah. um in there that, that you do that. So similar I have a similar question to that, just going back to your deductible uh, issue. Is there a way to tell, you know, if I do a thousand dollar deductible, I'm going to save this. If I do two thousand, if I do five thousand, is it is it linear or is it a curve? On, on car insurance, yes. And when we're quoting, uh, very easy on car insurance. Um, <clears throat> something interesting, and I have no idea how this works. We have found out in the last couple of weeks where um, a lot of people does a a percentage on their house for a deductible, right. 1%, 2%. Some carriers are going three. Um, we have found in value. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've got one carrier doing three. We're not putting anybody with them because nobody wants a 3% deductible. That's a lot of money when it comes to your house. Um, but a lot of carriers are moving into the 2% range. Um, something interesting that we have found is and it deals with the value of the house where this plays in. But let's say um, 2% of your house gives you right around the $5,000 deductible. Let's say it may be $5,200, right? Well, we have found in certain instances if you just put a flat $5,000 and not go percentage, it actually reduces your premium just a little bit. So I don't know how the algorithms play in that. Um but we have kind of found that out here recently and, and it's been able to save a couple of people some money um, based on that. So, so you can, I didn't even realize doing a flat rate was even an option. I always thought it was a percent. So you actually have, as a consumer, you have the option to do a flat rate yes, for your deductible. On some carriers. Well, if you've an auto perspective, it's two fifty five hundred or seven fifty, and those are flat, those aren't percentages. But I'm talking about I'm talking about homeowners. Yeah. Usually Ours homeowners is, is on a percentage, percentage okay. but we have just kind of recently found that out. Uh, and that's something that we had heard and kind of experimented with it a little bit and it's it's helped on a couple, not it's the odds are not likely, but we have tried it on a couple and it has helped. Um, the majority it hasn't really made that much of an effect on, but um, you're just kind of getting creative with stuff like that. Um, so some, on the percentage, I'm sorry to interrupt. On the percentage, it's based on your home's value, but where does that number come from? Is it the number that was established in your policy or whatever? Your, or I mean, yes. market value or your tax appraisal? Like, where does that number come yeah. from? Kind of what it's going to cost to put that house back. So replacement uh, value. Replacement, replacement value uh, yes. in the policy. Um, but how do you? But she's asking, how do you get to that? Because that value changes all the time. Mm -hmm. So how do you get? Do you do an appraisal on it every so often? Or? So we have an, a, a square footage calculator that goes in. So you put your square footage in there, and then from there it's got like basic, custom, premier, kind of however your house is set up. Let's say you have a, you know shelf gourmet kitchen inside there then we can put a premier kitchen in there and that will up the square footage cost a little bit or you can just put it as all basic and that keeps that cost down the the kicker in there is 
in the event of a total loss, you want to put that house back the way it was. So if you got a, you know, very custom house and we put you as a custom, your cost is going to be cheaper. But when it comes to rebuild that, you're not going to have the money there to rebuild it. So we try to find that that balance in there of putting you back the way the house was and having it there. Uh, one of our good carriers to kind of uh, fill that void there, if you will, let's say, let's say you've got 500000 in coverage, but the actual house costs five twenty five dollars to rebuild. Mm-hmm. We're off on that, right? We only had you covered for five hundred, but it costs five twenty five. Um, one of our good carriers that we like has a, I forget the percentage, but you can kind of go above the five hundred for a certain percentage, and it'll fill that void in there because it's not a, it's not an exact science. I mean, how much would it cost for you to rebuild your house right now? It's it's hard to exactly know right. that. Um, you think about it, you're like. Now you have a home that may have been a part of a community that was built with a bunch of other houses. You got a custom, you know, your house, Brand new house. tearing it down, you know, mm-hmm. getting it right, you yeah. know, cleared and all that, and build back up. So it's like you're building a custom home, even though you feel like, well, yeah, it wasn't really a custom home, but you know, at the time we built it, but just that one off. Because at the time of construction, the the framer was going from this house to this house yeah. to this house, yeah. so they get a much better deal. Yeah. Then you're going to have just calling in a framer on your own, and and or even you know your general contractor. So I think going back to her question, if I'm understanding you correctly, there's not necessarily a dollar amount. You know, like if you were to appraise your house every year, it would it's going to vary, it's going to change year yes. year year. Uh-huh. But you guys, as insurance or the or the carriers, not you personally, but the insurance carriers are not necessarily going out and doing some kind of a. So like they're not checking the tax records or something like that every year. Is that correct? I mean, so you're saying that if you're saying you place them under some category of coverage mm-hmm. and then if something happens to that house, then they go out <clears throat> and they do some kind of an appraisal and figure out what it's going to cost. And then based on what that category of coverage is, that's how they determine how much coverage you, coverage have. you get. Is that, is that, am I saying that right? Pretty much from a, from a cost basis. Now, after we put you with the carrier, a lot of them do go out and inspect the house. They're going out to inspect it to see if you got trees hanging on the roof. If you've got anything that they see is going to be a potential claim, mm-hmm. then they'll come out and address that. They're not looking for necessarily the value of the house. They're looking for, all right, now I'm insuring this thing. Do I see any potential liabilities here? Do I see a tree hanging, you know, rubbing the shingles? Mm-hmm. Um if it's a disaster, then they may just tell you you got 30 days to find other coverage. Um, if it's not too bad, they may just give you the recommendation, say, hey, trim the tree, you know, fix these few shingles over here, and we're good to go. You send in some pictures showing that's done, and, and you're good to go again. But as far as the value of the house, they're not really checking for that. That's more or less going on that square footage calculator. And that changes from like zip code to zip code. Mm-hmm. And that's also something every every year they're going to add to that coverage a little bit. Just as you know, with a realtor, it's the market's going. I mean, we're not in a great market right now, but the appraisals are still going up a little bit. So they just kind of know that. that. So, <laughs> so to add on it, so is it there's kind of what I think maybe also you were kind of asking about there's basically industry accepted tools to provide that cost to replacement costs. So like yes. when you guys, you you know what I'm saying? It's not like they haven't yeah. appraised it done, but there's like a tool that you use to replacement costs. And when we do loans and somebody provides the proof of insurance or evidence of insurance, a lot of times we'll ask for, Hey, can we get your replacement costs calculations to make sure that it covers the house mm. and but we just accept what the insurance company gives because they're using some type of accepted mm-hmm. industry tool exactly. to calculate that and they're usually pretty close so how does <clears throat> your personal finance affect insurance uh in what direction are you thinking as far as personal i mean your <laughs> insurance score deductible being able to be covered and stuff like that. well your insurance score uh and that's something else on saving you know Let's say when you get insurance or whatever your house, um, you're not in the best of financial situations and you rock along. I don't know exactly how long it takes to get your 
credit, your actual credit number up. Um, but maybe in two or three years, you come back and have that recalculated. And if you've got better scores, then that's going to reduce your premium as well. <laughs> but overall, uh, insurance, I mean, is a major factor in everybody's budget. With it going up, we're just trying to try to give you the, the ways, the means to lower it as much as possible. Um, it's going up. We have to have, it's kind of like gasoline. You get, still got to have it no matter the cost, but it's how you can limit, you know, what can you do to kind of keep that within reason as much as possible? Um, without losing the important coverages. That you without need. losing. Yes. Um, it, it kind of goes back to, um, like have an uninsured motorist, um, uninsured or underinsured motorist. Uh, you can take that off your auto policy. I don't suggest that. It makes a very little value of the overall premium. And I can tell you, you're driving by a lot of people every day on the street that, number one, don't have any coverage at all. Or there's a ton of people that don't have enough. Um, well, I would venture to guess that as the insurance rates have gone up, that it is even more important to carry that uninsured motorist because there are yeah. people who are reducing their coverage to save money or just not paying for it at all. Yes. And that makes up, again, that makes it such a little part of your premium that if you cut that off, you're not cutting off. I mean, it's not like you're going to drop the premium by 50 percent or anything. It's such a small part of it that there's I couldn't encourage somebody going that way because you're exactly right. As it goes up, that number is just getting more and more, uh, you know, more people that don't have it. Mm -hmm. And when you think about even being underinsured, if they're carrying state minimums, that doesn't go as far as it did even five years ago. I mean, the the bumpers on some of these cars now are twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars because of the cameras and the sensors and all the stuff that goes with them. So that adds a part of the reason insurance is going up because if you just roll into somebody at a stop sign where ten years ago, you know, you could buy a bumper for two or three hundred bucks, you know, five hundred, whatever, and you're on your way not a big deal now that just turned into a three thousand dollar accident now with the sensors and the cameras and the calibrations and the safety features and so insurance companies have to account for that that there's not really a minor accident anymore uh, even mirrors hanging on the side of these cars with the lane assist and the all that stuff it's just nothing is cheap when it goes to the body shop anymore so if you think about that, you understand that the insurance company has to cover that in the in the case of an accident. So they're having to up the premiums to cover all these safety features and all the stuff that goes with these new cars. So, so what's going on right now? Um, unfortunately, I can't say that it's going to get any better. Uh, we have had one carrier uh, this week say they're going to take another rate increase before the end of the year. So where I was hoping it was going to level out, um, and we deal with multiple different carriers. So I'm not going to say every carrier is doing that. They all take rate increases at different time. Um, so it's it's just hard to say. So what is, um, I guess, where do they get the data to determine rates and different things, you know, like obviously we've got mortgage rates dependent on, you know, the Fed and the way that all, yeah. like all that. So where, where does the, what information are they looking at? Like this carrier to determine that they need to increase their rates. What kind of data are they looking at to determine that? So the people that do come up with that are some very, very smart actuaries, probably locked away in a basement somewhere, <laughs> you know, and they just yeah. punch in numbers all day. Um, truth. I mean, that is the truth. I don't know if they are in the basement, but they are, there are actuaries that are figured and it's even figured as, as, down to a, to a zip code. Mm -hmm. um, so they're looking at the lost history of that zip code. How often uh, is a hell storm hitting that zip code? Mm -hmm. um, how many people are having accidents in that? So to kind of go... And they're looking at, just to be clear, I'm assuming they're looking not just at people within their own service, but across all... Across the board. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So... And when they look at that, going back just a little bit, let's say one particular carrier is 
like got a lot of the market share in 76063. Mm -hmm. 76063 just continually gets getting hit with hail. So they're taking the brunt of that, that carrier. So after they see that, they're like, man, we're losing our shorts in Mansfield. So they're going to start non-renewing people or, or making the rates really high. Right. Kind of encouraging you to go somewhere else because they want to sure. limit that market share. Um, so with that being said, you know, in the Metroplex, the, you know, four or five counties we have here, there are some carriers not wanting any part of this because of the hailstorms that we've had, the ice storm, the freezing, You're talking about water damage. A lot of people had broken pipes, flooded their homes during, during the freezing. But what's interesting is you go maybe down to Hill County or, you know, somewhere down south where if it hails there, it may hit, you know, five houses in, you know, one square mile. Mm -hmm. To the insurance company, it's almost like, well, it didn't hail that bad down there. Well, it destroyed the corn crop, but I mean, at least we didn't have to buy, you know, houses. Right. Where up here, it's it hits a whole lot more houses. Right. Because we're just, you know, packed on top of each other. So if it hails, hundreds of homes get, get hit at one time. So the rates per, the rates are going to vary per county per zip code, but also how much does what's happening nationally, like if there's hurricanes on the coast and whatnot, or even our hail damage yeah. to other parts of the yeah, country. Yeah, how does that like, affect North Dakota or whatever? Right. So, right. so in that, and that's even, expand that out that can even be a, a worldwide issue so insurance companies that that you know the names of and you see on tv and all this stuff they buy insurance as well called reinsurance so when you start going for reinsurance that opens it up a little bit bigger to that more broad area so when you start having hurricanes on these coasts or it could be stuff you know on the other side of the pond or over the world whatever the reinsurance costs are more. So when your favorite carrier goes to buy reinsurance, their cost is more money. So mm -hmm. then what do you think they're going to do? Pass that cost on down to you. Um, okay. So that's how, on a broader scale, the reinsurance affects. But that's kind of one of those things that nobody ever thinks about. But that is... You know, insurance companies do buy insurance for themselves. Okay. So. so like Hill County with the five houses per square mile, their insurance is maybe not as high as what we have because of the their the situation. Density. But right. but thank you, their density. But um but their premiums have also gone up. A certain percentage, not as drastic as we are. Okay. But they they will still go up. Okay. Yes. And and a lot of that just comes down to you know, look how much shingles cost when it does hail. I mean, you know, yeah. the roofing's expensive, and yeah. so just the just the sheer cost of everything um, makes it go up. Does your sorry, I, sorry, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> does your um, auto claims and your homeowners claims do they affect each other? If you have insurance, with, or I guess if you do or don't have insurance with the same carrier, if I've got the three auto claims, am I in danger of also losing my Homeowners insurance with that company, or generally not. Uh, are you saying if you're paired with the same? Well, I guess yes or no. I mean, if okay. they're if they're looking at claim history and you're saying it's harder to get insurance if you've got three claims in the last three to five years. If I'm getting homeowners insurance, are they also looking at other claims I've made as far as auto and whatnot? I can tell you in one one instance that we've had within maybe the last week or two, that was an issue. So we were strictly trying to acquire home insurance for one particular client, mm -hmm. and they had looked at their claim history on the auto side and saw the frequency there and then decided to not give a quote on the homeowner's insurance. So It's like kind of like a credit history in a way. It's like, yeah, hey, it's, all these other people you didn't, you know, there's an issue over here, so it's likely that it could happen. Oh, yes, homeowners. and that's that's right. the same thing. And well, it's and just, especially if you're especially if you're a first time home buyer and you don't have homeowners insurance history itself, the only thing they can look at is your auto. Mm. Thing. Yeah, and it, yeah. I'm not going to say that happens that often, but in this hard market again, where they're getting real picky and choosy on who they who they accept, they have kind of broadened their their eyes to see what's going on. All providers are picky and choosy. So all, 
Um, so I guess I don't understand where are the uninsured going. Are they remaining uninsured? There's generally always a place somewhere. It's just how much is it going to cost you? Yeah. That's the unfortunate. But when we're saying a lot of these providers aren't even giving them a quote, it doesn't matter the return. They're they're not taking the risk for that return. Correct. But there are going to always be providers that are going to be higher rates. Yes. Yeah. So that's one of the things with being like an independent agent. We've got several different carriers that we choose from. We definitely still have some that will write. It may be expensive, but then we still have some that are just like, eh. Or, so like years ago or if you came to me we could get you you know however many quotes uh you know let's say 10 quotes or you know whatever the number is with with our carriers now depending on your situation we may be down to two quotes because just the amount of carriers don't want to ride in certain counties and a lot of it has to do with dallas tarrant Collin, uh denton is coming in there so your immediate counties right here Carriers just like oh, we got we got too many houses in that market. We're going to back out. Got another question. Um, so on the commercial side, we have property insurance, which mm-hmm. that you know that's replacement cost, right? But then there's liability insurance. That's if anything happens on that property that you know a fall a slip or whatever. Yes. On the consumer side, so homeowners insurance does that cover the liability side of things if somebody were to. Slip and fall, or is that an entirely separate? On on your personal homeowner's insurance, yes, there is some liability protection there. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, but you bring up commercial property insurance. Commercial property insurance is going up dramatically, and, and kind of for the for the same same factors. Uh, now, what on the commercial property side of it, you just got to do whatever you can to limit any liability, and, and you know if you've got. Uh, you know, ledges or anything like that. Make sure you got handrails up there. If it's a if it's an older building, you know, are you doing updates to electrical, or plumbing, uh, how's the roof? If you're doing any type of upgrades to that building, be sure and let your agent know. That way, they can pass that on to the carrier. Mm-hmm. Try to keep those rates down the best they can. What, during underwriting, um, whenever it comes to the commercial side of things, we we look at available cash and some of that has to do with down payments for things but also has to do with in the event of an event um, then are they able to cover those deductibles because that will quickly put a business out of business yeah so we see that on a daily basis too yes and yeah. that's tell me are you guys doing assessments where you can go out and um maybe like give those recommendations, recommendations like, and things. If you did this, this might lower. Because I would think that would almost be a game plan or a strategy. On some we do. Some it's not, not, we don't do that a lot. Um, but on some we can definitely, especially in the right situations. Maybe it's an older building. And, and that's also uh, Lee brought up earlier about inspections. They do the same thing with commercial property. So if they go out there, they'll definitely have a list. Uh, and that could be down to like parking lot repairs. Because mm-hmm. again, going back to liability, if anybody trips in the parking lot, that's a liability problem. So if there's mm-hmm. a lot of potholes out there, anything like that, that'll be recommendations to fix that. Um, again, just going back to try to limit anything they can um, that could be a potential liability. Um, and that goes across the board. That's even like worker compensation. Um, that hasn't really went up at all. Um, that has stayed pretty flat, but as you look at uh, workers' comp and protecting your people and are they wearing the right safety gear, uh, does the machines have all their safety functions, you know, just taking care of the little stuff uh, limits those claims. Um, also, it gets into, in workers' comp, you have what's called a mod report, and that's basically you have a number there that's your particular number for your industry. So let's say you're in in the roofing industry. Uh, If you have a a one mod, that compares you to to other roofers in the industry. So that doesn't compare you to manufacturing or office, it's roofers. If your mod number is below one, then you're getting a cheaper rate than the average guy. So you're good. And and that can go down to like 0.18, which is very hard to get to. but if you're in the point nines, I mean that's good. You're 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 spending less money on premium than the average roofer. 
if your claims get up there, your frequency, you're having guys, you know, get hurt, then that, that mod starts going up above one. And let's say it's a, you know, 1.1, you're paying 10% more money on premium than the average roofer. So it kind of gives you a baseline. Um, and if you're, you know, even worse off than that, it could, you know, even creep up more than that. So when your mod gets above that one, you really need to start looking at, all right, what's causing my company to have more claims, more frequency than, than the average guy? And again, it's not comparing your roofing company to the office workers and all that. It's, it's roofing industry against roofing industry. So that just kind of gives you a baseline. Um, and roofers in particular can spend a lot of money, as you can imagine, on workers' comp because it's more risky. Um, but it just kind of gives you a baseline to be able to protect that. Um, as well, kind of going back to saving money, just making sure you have a good return to work program. So if, if that does happen and somebody gets hurt, you know, how quickly you, how quickly you report it, you know, how quickly can you get that person back to work? You know, have you a plan mapped out there to get them back on the job? So in every aspect where it's, you know, general liability, property, workers comp, there's going to be certain things you can do to try to re reduce that premium as much as you can uh, within your control. I mean, it's, it's all going up, but at least you can, you feel like you have some kind of control over it, you know, at least what doesn't go up as much. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question about just kind of going back to how this relates to overall personal finance. So this is kind of going back to personal mm -hmm. <clears throat> with regards to insurance. Is there like in, in the mortgage industry, for example, you know, you guys have numbers that y'all use for, you know, uh, loan to value and, and uh, percent of income, you know, you, you don't do a loan greater than a certain percentage of income or whatever. Is there some kind of a figure like that, that, you know, the average person should not be paying more than X percent of their income in insurance premiums? Is there something like that that is out there? Not you know? that I've ever heard from like, you know, even financial people or anything yeah. like that. I've never heard really a, a solid number on that. And that's, it's got to be a balance in there, right? Of the more assets you have to protect, yeah, the more insurance you're going to have. But at the same time, the more assets you have, probably the greater your financial strength as well. Um, but for the average person who's only, you know, I'm, I'm talking middle income people, mm -hmm. who's who's generally their only assets are going to be their house and their and car. car. Yeah, they may have a few. You know, toys here, but they're not anything major. Like, mm -hmm. a, you know, they're not, they don't have a huge art collection or whatever, like somebody in the upper echelons are going to have. Right. They're not having to insure all these other things like you're talking about. But, you know, so for those people that are in the middle class, as these premiums keep going up, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it just stands to reason that the, the percentage of their total income is that they're paying toward insurance premiums is going up and up and up too. And I know we, 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 you're talking specifically here about, you know, homeowners and auto. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really haven't even covered health insurance costs, but that's right. something that we all have to deal with, or most of us, especially if we're self-employed. I know if we have employers that cover that, that's really nice. But mm -hmm. most of us in the self-employed world don't have anything right. like that. And then there's also, you know, life insurance, which yeah. we haven't even delved into yet either. But when you start adding all of these premiums up, I mean, I was just kind of, as you're sitting here talking, I'm thinking to myself, wow, that's, that's kind of, that's quite a lot of that's insurance. That's a lot of money for situations that may never, ever, exactly. ever happen to you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and but it's at some too point, risky not to have, well, right? So it, like, it is, but then at some point. Right. It is, but it isn't. I mean, at some point, as a, as a you, you got to think as a consumer, at some point, you're going to go, I don't know, you know what, I'm willing to roll the dice on my yeah. Because yeah. the odds of me dying at this age is yeah. probably slim. I'm well, healthy or whatever, so I might scary. I might cut my life insurance, you know. Right. And so, and I realize there's a risk associated with that. But as the premiums go up, that risk becomes the risk of of you know losing your income is, <laughs> is greater than the risk of whatever the catastrophe right. is that you're paying right. to insure. Yeah. There's a ton of people walking around with no health insurance. For that, right. like exactly, you know, because because those rates are going up too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I don't know that there is a certain like percentage number you can throw on that. It just comes down to wherever you feel like that risk, not risk versus reward, but where the risk right. and premium kind of kind of equal out. I mean, there is definitely an it is expensive. Like, I'm not going to say it's not. And that's just something either the personal people have to weigh out or, or on the business side. But even if you like, if for what you're saying, for your items, if you if you don't have a lien holder, you can make that choice. You sell right. Absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. You can decide. You can like, go, like you know what? Health insurance I don't or life insurance. what the norm is. I'm right. gonna, I want you to only right. insure this amount. Yes. But if you have any or kind of, but if you have any kind of lien holder, if you have a mortgage or if you don't have yeah, a lien holder, right? Like you yeah. have to. So have maybe insurance. the goal is to not have a lien holder. Well, even if you want to have a lien the goal is. Yeah. <laughs> you can control yeah. your fossil exactly. sensibility. There, mm-hmm. there might not be a formula for percentage of income or anything like that, but we put insurance costs into every single cash flow. And the cash flow, that is a precise model, right? So we, there is a figure that you have to hit. But people don't think about that on the loan side. Insurance and loans go hand in hand. Um, whether it be it, real estate is the most obvious one, yeah. but it's not just real it's not just real estate. That, you know, if there's a large piece of equipment that we're financing, we're going to require insurance on that equipment. Because if it ever goes down, we need our collateral to then be re- replaced. If we have a dentist that doesn't have much, much in assets and we're doing a loan based on what his high income is and he loses two fingers, then we, we're not going to get paid back because he can no longer practice. We're going to require key man insurance for that too. We, You will find that 99% of the time there's a loan that's above a certain threshold. There's going to be an associated insurance that goes along with it. Because we're going to have collateral. If it's unsecured, that probably has to do with a high income earner. We're going to require key man insurance for that. Mm-hmm. If they can't practice or if they can no longer create income, we're going to get paid back one way or the other. And then going back to mortgage as well, that's one of the things. If if your your income qualifies you for X amount of house, you also have to figure in the insurance cost. That's, that's just a cost that goes with that. So. If you could afford five hundred thousand just as a pure payment, but then you figure in what insurance is going to cost all that, maybe you're down to affording, you know, I don't know, four seventy four. It's going to adjust in that market somewhere because that's something the mortgage company is going to require, um, as well as if it's in a floodplain that opens up flood insurance and in another situation there. But but to your point, Lee, it's. Can I get you to a point where you can't afford your insurance? Absolutely. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a matter of finding that balance yeah. of, okay, we're, we're all self-insuring to a certain point, right? Okay, even if I gave you a million, million dollar umbrella policy today, and you go out there and you totally do something unforeseen, right? And it ends up being a million five lawsuit against you. Yeah. You didn't have enough insurance because you got that five hundred thousand dollar gap. Well, maybe we should have got you a two million dollar umbrella. But the way can afford a two million dollar umbrella. So at a certain point you we're all self insuring mm-hmm. to a certain point. Yeah. You just try to fill as much of that that you can afford. Because I mean I'm not I mean you gotta eat, right? I'm, I wanna sell you all the insurance I can, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all got to eat, right? So, I mean, there's a threshold right there where you're like, yeah, I'm going to insure to this amount, and then I'm going to kind of self-insure over that. Yeah. Um, and that even comes down to your car limits. You know, you're going to pick a limit right there where you're like, okay, I'm going to buy up to this amount and hope nothing goes over that. Yeah. So, it's just a balance there. So, speaking of an umbrella policy, who do you recommend those for? Is that something, um, I don't know, that, I mean, as far as the general public, like who, when you talk to them, would you say, you know, you may want to consider this product? So, for people that have done well, successful people that have some assets, Mm -hmm. have something worth going after, Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be kind of a target demographic there now with that being said you know teenage drivers you know if you got teenage drivers that's a reason to have it uh, if you got a swimming pool if you got atvs you know maybe you invite people out to your place and y'all ride atvs we all know how dangerous atvs are if you want them to be they can be very dangerous um 
you know, in that situation. So if you've got some assets, you've got some money put away in the bank, you've got a nice house, you've got, you know, you've got some assets and you deal in any type of risky kind of activity and risky is like, I said, could be all the way down to teenage drivers, right? We know uh, statistically they can get in accidents on the road. So, you know, if, if they get in a bad accident and it goes over your car insurance, limits and then that umbrella can kick in and and so you've got that bucket of insurance money over there before you even have to worry about getting personally you know brought into something so i don't know nothing about umbrella insurance but we're not saying that an umbrella insurance policy can replace any of these auto policies no you're always going to have your underlying policy in addition to it just goes over and above that <clears throat> Yes, so that's the that's the people that really need to look at. In case they try to come after all your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that goes to busy. So you see, we see that I strongly recommend it for individuals as well um, that have acquired assets, but especially in businesses as well, because like let's say the trucking industry, right? They all need umbrella insurance because every other billboard you see on the side of the road asks right. if you were in a trucking accident. Like that's just, <laughs> it's just like that's more true. and more common. If, yeah, if you're if you're I in business, mm -hmm. there somebody's looking to get <laughs> get at yeah. you. So that's just the unfortunate nature of it. So okay, so let's wrap this up for today. What are your final words of wisdom, advice? My final advice would be you definitely have to have insurance. Try to cover what you can out of pocket until it gets up to that threshold where, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this into insurance. And, and you have it there for a reason. You have it there for accidents. And, and I don't want it to sound like you've never, you know, you can never turn anything into insurance and use it. You absolutely can. I would just make sure it's kind of for those reasons that, that you can't afford or you know it, it justifies that and there's not an exact dollar amount but don't don't nickel and dime that insurance because they're going to come back and and get you 